Hello everyone, welcome to the live question and answer session for session 13 of the Exarch Discord YouTube conference. I'll start with a question for Simriti. You mentioned that you were hoping experimental archaeology would work towards eliminating the hierarchy between craftspeople and academics. Did this work? I'm not sure we as yet have a conversation, but I do think in kind of practicing some of this ourselves, at least it makes it easier for us to kind of have these conversations and establish some of these connections. But yeah, I think we're far from having an answer. Thank you. And a question for Tim. Would you use synthetic clay normally? Um, and if not, why do you prefer natural clay? Uh, yes, good question. Um, so uh, normally I would use uh, natural clays found, <coughs> excuse me, in the wild. Um, but to thoroughly understand the mineralogy and the particle size of, um, of these clays, I just chose to synthesize and make an artificial sort of form of, of uh, clay body so that um, I, you know, for better understanding of what one would be looking for and what in fact um, the potters of prehistory would be looking for in terms of bodies for open firing. So the synthesized body is very much um, just a benchmark, if you like, so that as a sort of control, so that uh, just for better understanding. And in, in that sense, it works incredibly well. I mean, it's just got incredible firing tolerance. Um, um, so it does shed a lot of light on the uh, particle size uh, distribution in, in wild clays that would be suitable. Fantastic, thank you. And a question for Alessandro. You mentioned that the tools need a lot of maintenance. Do you have an estimate of how much time it added to the construction of the boat? Hi, yeah, that's a good question. No, we haven't done it. And I think that's gonna be a good project for the future. I mean, but my my experience on this project, so most of this project was that at the time it's, it's significant and it's actually a really interesting aspect of experimental archeology span in general, but then <clears throat> particularly on boat building. So hopefully in the future, I'll be able to document some of these aspects more deeply. Fantastic, thank you. We'll move on to Juicy. You mentioned you washed the stones before using them. Do you think the residues yes. from the river and also the pressure from your hand would have affected the use wear? Not the use wear, but we are doing also residues analysis and this will be affected definitely from the residues from the river and from my hands. Ah, thank you. And um, the kind of the pressure used for grinding, did you measure that in any way? No, I'm doing a uh, multiple experiment and I'm uh, thinking also to involve uh, more people to have a different type of pressure, a different type of gesture. But right now, no, we didn't measure it. Thank you. And Franz, could you elaborate on the upcoming Turing exhibition of experimental archaeology that you're organizing? Oh uh, yeah, well, the, the exhibition was organized in cooperation with Exarch. And we invited the scientists from, well, all over the world who actually participate in this conference. We are well, we offering them to a show to actually display their experiments, not only online, but actually in an exhibition. We have 25 experiments collected so far from 46 participants from 11 nations. So it's a, it's a very colorful and very, very nice assembly of, of experiments. And well, it, it will be on display, actually it is already on display in, in Asparn until November. So provided uh, it's possible to, to have access in, in, in the current situation with COVID. But next year it will be on display in Scotland, uh, the Cranach Center, hopefully. And we'll be happy to, to pass it on afterwards. We're quite looking forward to have it for, for a tour in, in the next five, six, seven years. I don't know how long. And uh, actually it's, it's the first of its kind for, for a long time. Actually we will have um, a trailer online and uh, we'll, we'll carry out regular talks every second week, starting next Thursday where I will talk with um, participants about their experiments. So that would be also on, in, in the YouTube channel. 
So we'll be happy if you want to join them. Fantastic. Um, there's also been a link to the exhibition has been posted um, on yeah. the Exarch YouTube and Discord chat. Yeah, since Exarch is a partner, uh, we of course will be share that. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. And I have a question for George about the Egyptian casting. Uh, yesterday we had an interesting talk which looked at different colored metal used in Greek bronzes. Do you know if the Egyptian bronzes would have also been multicolored? I cannot directly answer to your question because I don't know the, the, the Greek technology. I just like to say that what we present is a real link between the archaeological data and what we do in experimentation. So in this case, it's also teamwork. And I would like to thank my old colleagues about and the student because hours of, of work about that. The only thing it does is we use technology to know the, the different layer. And we are sure about the five layers that we used. So for the future, I think that we would like to, to maybe not try the Greek technology, but we would like to do a tourist. Uh, it's a 60 centimeter long uh, statue. So for the future, we would like to do something more, uh, more huge and more heavy. But for this moment, it's too early to, to answer to your question. I don't know. I'm sorry. No problem. Thank you. I have another question for you. Would the statues have been finished in another way following casting? The, the statue after the after casting is very, is they are really clean. So the, the main idea is that you, you, you take more time to, to process the creation from the layer and it's months of creation. And the more, the main idea is that when it's finished, normally you just need to have a little sound of a sandy stone, just to have a good looking, but normally you don't have any work on, on the statue. You can, you can just cut the, the pouring system and you parts stay away to be the support for the, for the basis. But for the rest, the statue are normally very, very nice. So you, you need to, to do just a shining effect. It's only this because they like a little the, um, the gold effect that the bronze can create. It's also one of the reasons why they use the bronze. But what is very, very nice with this technology is that you use only donkey donk, you use clay and fermentation and, and you mix everything. But after, I can say three months of preparation and after two months of application, when you open the, the mold, you wave the good result directly because they are very, very clever and they, are, they make a super job. And they are all lazy but smart. It's always time a link between the both. What I would like to say is that they, they understand so well the technology that they create at the end something very nice. Not so like the modern way where you need a lot of tools. In this case, you have something very good in the past. We do, <laughs> for us, it's different. Sometimes we need more time, but we try to have the same results. So like we see also in the museum and it's what we would like, it's a goal we would like to have. Thank you. I have a question for Tim. Do you think people in prehistory would have had a favorite source for clay? And do you think it would be possible to identify individual potters at a site based on the clay type? Hi, oh, yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. The, the answer is yes. The potters of prehistory would definitely have a favorite source of clay. If you look at evidence of current open firing cultures around the world, there are very few at the moment and they're, they're disappearing very quickly but they go to extreme lengths to find the right clay and the right temper. In some cases, they have local clays, but they will travel miles and miles on foot to sometimes days, day long journeys to collect the absolute correct clay and the right temper that they know from tradition will be successful. So I've absolutely no doubt that the potters of prehistory would have exactly the same rationale. And, and they, would, they would have their favorite sources of clay, their favorite sources of temper based on results and based on knowledge that's been passed down through the uh, ceramic generations, if you like. So Absolutely. I think that's the, the, the centre of my research, really, is the fact that it, it's such a sophisticated way of working in one sense. And yet, if you look at it at face value, it seems, you know, quite basic. 
but the experiments have shown that you really need to source exactly the right materials otherwise your your success rate is incredibly low so the, the very good question but the answer is yes favorite clays favorite tempers and they would not in any sense uh, move away from that until it was proved through time I totally agree with you. The answer is very, very nice. And if I can say, I, I work close from, I work in the desert close from the Red Sea. And uh -huh. in this case, uh, the first thing is to say, okay, it's a local clay for the technical ceramic. And now after also many years of digging, we can say that the clay come from far, far away. And they bring the clay uh, through the desert after five or six days of running. Because, so like you say, if you don't understand the quality of the material and they know very well the quality of the material, you don't have any success. And no. for the melting, for example, to make the crucible, mm -hmm. they, they would like to have a success because they are there to make the job. And so they select very, very well the, the clay. It's really something really important. Thank you. That's very interesting. Do you have something yeah. to add to this? Yeah, I was just gonna. Um, I'm not sure if it's a question or if it's just a, like thinking aloud. But one of the things that uh, Ray and I noticed was a lot of the practices. I think are changing in like the recent, um, you know, ten years. Um, partial thought of is adding to pollution, especially if it's in an urban space, uh, and you know, space constraints make it very really hard for them to continue open firing. Um, but in terms of the clay sourcing, um, I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, I feel like the choices seem to be limited, and and the choices seem to be made based on what the um, best possible alternative. Uh, because of rising costs, decreasing demands in some cases for the kind of produce that's been made. Um, and then like the, you know, their ability to source it. And the other thing that we did find is that places where there are more families doing pottery together, uh, they're able to mobilize more resources, whereas in places where there are one or two of them, uh, obviously it's much harder for them to be able to make demands on you know where they're able to get the clay from i'm also wondering whether factors like this are particular to now because of the kind of you know neoliberal policies and times that we live in or whether it would be a factor in the past as well yeah that's really interesting i think in the environmental factors are really interesting in present day open firing situations i think the environment and the the restrictions are obviously very prevalent, but I'm not so sure that those restrictions would be prohibitive in the past. Do you think that would be the case? The other thing I've been thinking of is how much is an open fighting contributing um, in terms of this, whether it is, like how much of it is a perceived anxiety of the present. Um, and I mean, in terms of resources also, I've been wondering because one of the things we heard from a lot of the potters is the availability of wood for the firing and you know how it's becoming more expensive right now it seems like they are using whatever is possible in the like for example they use uh bark or, or like uh, things that come out of the coconut i actually don't know what to call it part of the coconut tree that comes out and they use parts of that in the firing and i can imagine how with like kind of space decreasing it's going to be harder to get sourced Earlier, I wonder whether, you know, some of this is waste from another activity that is then being used in this. I'm actually not sure how to understand it because, I mean, I also see the danger of romanticizing the past in this or thinking that it's a completely different time. I was interested in what you have to say about it. Yeah, well, one thing that's really interesting in, in this sense is that wood is probably a secondary material, uh, wood as we know it, timber, split timber from substantial woody stems, was probably a secondary material. And I found that primarily the best form of fuel for open firing is actually much more grass-like. And it, I mean, if you look at the firings, for instance, in Papua New Guinea, you see that actual what we would call wood 
is very much a secondary backup material and the much more flexible reed-like and grass-like materials and leaf fronds, for instance, which are quite sustainable and very and highly renewable. So environmentally, it may it does make a lot of sense. Also, I I now think that coppice material would have been used probably as early as the Mesolithic. I mean, there's evidence of coppicing now from Mesolithic through Neolithic. And I think the remnants of the day-to-day process of coppicing would be absolutely ideal for open firing. So the idea many years ago was that open firing was made basically from that the fuel use was sourced from woodland is probably not so important uh, in my opinion um, and, and and so this more renewable very fast generating stem materials like grasses and reeds and and dried uh, woody leaves seem to be a much a much more positive uh, approach especially especially today in terms of environment and totally sustainable because the net co2 is um, zero well, that's a fantastic point. Thank you for all getting involved in that. Alessandro, is there a theoretical limit to the size of a stone plank vessel? Is it affected by the planks you can get? Well, obviously it depends by the timber that you use, the species that you use. The archaeological evidence is very limited. So we have planks which are up to three and a half meters, but you can get you know much, much longer, obviously <laughs> much longer planks. For example, I'm thinking about teak, for example, and you can get, you can easily reach 10 meters planks. These are very rare, but obviously you can have them uh, that long. Do you think you could go beyond that length? Yeah, most probably, yes. I have worked with 10 uh, up to 12 meters planks in in the project I was involved too, but obviously the limit is just depends by the yeah by the species and uh, how lucky you are in finding a relatively straight tree and uh, how good you are in cutting it with the desired length interesting thank you and a question for juicy are you planning to do less controlled experiments outside of the lab environment for example not wearing gloves to see if there are any differences in the wear traces produced Yes, I'm trying. I'm thinking to do um, experimental uh, involving more people and also uh, more resource on the same uh, using the same stones. And then I want to compare uh, the trace on both on the archaeological and on the experimental controlled one. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. And a question for Franz: How has your work at the physical center been affected by the pandemic, and what are your plans for the future? Well, of course, the, the pandemic is, is overshadowing everything. Uh, well, actually, I don't know if you follow it. Uh, today, we are into our fourth uh, lockdown, which will continue. Well, we don't know how long, probably to the end of April. Uh, well, of course, it, it, it's a great, great effect uh, to, to everything we do. Uh, first of all, of course, the, the exhibition will be closed for the time being. We hope to open, as I said, probably in, in May again or if you're lucky, it might be mid-April. Since we have the archaeological park, it is possible to do uh, some activities outdoors. We have the for the experimental archaeology classes in cooperation with the Vienna University. They will take place in the beginning of July, so we are quite hopefully that they can start as planned. But of course, part of the program accompanying uh, the exhibition is a hands-on program and, and experiment experiences and, and all this kind uh, but this uh, at the moment has it was stalled and it's probably taking place only from may on so we're shifting much into on, on, on online media and well we're waiting for better times basically yeah understandable absolutely um samriti did you want to contribute to that yeah, so I have, I have worked on megalithic burials in, in South India, and I was really interested in the experiment. One of the things I think we've noticed from our, our megalithic burials is this kind of uh, rituals connected to after like the first time burials, so there's repeated activity uh, beyond the first uh, use, uh, and there's revisiting of the burials, but also inclusion and removal of 
artifacts into the budget or out of the budget. So it has been thinking of it as not a one-time activity, but like the repeated interaction of people with the monument. So I was wondering if that's something you can, that would be of interest in your experiment, or is that something that cannot be factored in? You're referring to our uh, burial mount. We, we built, well, there are many factors involved in, in this. So one, of course, would be storytelling, and it's part of the display in our open-air archaeological park. As a matter of fact, it's quite a complex uh, experiment uh, where a whole team was involved concerning several research questions. So the preservation of textiles, for example, or bone samples, and pottery, of course, and the effects of bronze uh, corrosion on organic materials. And another kind of, we just took the chance uh, to rebuild the mound. Of course, the material was, was still there. The original mound was excavated uh, back in the 1970s and transferred stone for stone into our open air park, but had to re be removed in 2013 for complete reestablishment and, and the reconstruction of the park. But the stones were uh, piled somewhere in the, in the backyard. They, they had to be removed from that place. So we just took the chance uh, to rebuild it and so to give it a bit more sense and um, we, we connected it to the cremation experiments we had to, uh, for three years from 2018 on. Um, to have, we went to, to create some comparative data with uh, an actual body burial inside the mound. This will be kind of on display for, let's say, 15 years now, so 15 to 20 years, before we'll be subjected to excavation then. So the, the materials from the pyres were, of course, collected and, and sampled, and some of the material, the, the bronze artifacts especially, were cut in half, and one half is stored on the labor, laboratory conditions, and the other half will, was buried with the rest of the materials, the charred bones and so on. And after a period of, let's say, 15 years, we'll have the opportunity to compare how the materials uh, altered and changed uh, under the burial conditions. Fantastic. Yeah. And I have a question for Boris now. What kind of evidence do you have that allowed you to understand exactly how each tool was used? Was it common sense, input from experienced craftsmen, or are there detailed historic instructions? Let's say a combination of all of that. We have ancient sources, we have ancient written sources, and we have reliefs which show us the, the use of some of the, of the tools. And in the case of our blacksmith, common sense or common experience, as you know, craftsmen have traditions that are reaching back over centuries. So I would say a combination of all of um, these experiences and our own experiences. When we built our old boat in 2018, we had a lot of experiences because then we used electricity, but in order to fit in the planks in the right order and making a fitting very well so that um, no water would uh, get in. We had to uh, plane all the planks um, and the, the progress and the fitting in, uh, the, the, uh, the, we had to use all the um, methods of uh, craftsmen, which are well at, uh, over centuries. Thank you. Um, and we were previously talking with Alessandro about building boats, and he found that tool maintenance added to the construction time because they had to upkeep the tools in a way they didn't expect. Did you also find that the tools needed maintenance more than you expected? And did that add to the overall time of construction? Yes, let's say two sentences about that. But, um, we are um, still at the beginning of our uh, building process, but we can see already now that we have to add special tools in our building process, like clamps. And nobody, uh, nobody is saying an anything about clamps in, the, in antiquity, but <clears throat> they are necessary in order to fix the planks uh, into the right order and, and so on. And we have a little bit experience uh, in using clamps in clinker boats, uh, let's say Viking boats um, in Roskilde, the, the colleagues there who are um, who will come in a few weeks uh, uh, to us and will hopefully uh, support us a little bit. You know, the clamps in Viking boats are different from that in our kind of boats because, you know, these boats are cravel, they, the, they have a smooth um, outer they are smooth, they have no clinker, clinker construction. The clamps have, therefore have to be very big 
And uh, there we have no experience right now. So we have to get the experience all the time. Thank you. And a question for Udaya. I noticed that you only used single bellows. Is there a reason for this? Or could it be possible to use a double bellows system? So it is, there's a possible to use a double bellows. Raise the temperature. If you want to melt almost uh, like a uh, two kg, three kg of iron, single bellows is enough. No, using like 10 kilos is a good enough to raise the temperature. Otherwise, it's very difficult to raise the temperature, to increase our temperature while smelting. So I use like first experiment, I used a single bellow. Second experiment, I used double bellow. So that uh, temperature has increased, like uh, we can understand how we are using the bellows. And the bellows, while using the bellows, there should not be any gap of pumping the air. It should be continuous to whether the temperature will reduce. So that's what, it's like according to how much cage you are uh, melting a metal, like even copper or iron. Thank you. Tim, do you think that your work could lead us to a better way of looking at archaeological ceramics and being able to assess the firing possibilities of their clay recipes? The simple answer is, ye is yes. <laughs> From looking at work that I've done in the past, um, going back longer than I, <laughs> I care to remember now, but I think that the, the main problem experimental firing groups found with open firing was that it was almost a given that you would you would find a, a local clay that's as convenient as possible in a sense and then add tempering material to it and fire it and the losses have always been huge really and it's always been a stumbling block uh, for open firing where you've got no real control over the heat transfer at the very early stages of firing and so looking at, in a much more detailed way, the clay body constitution itself, I think does shed a lot of light on how things were done in the past. So the answer is, is yes, definitely. I, for one, will look very differently now at how clays were formulated and that I've got a much better uh, understanding of the sophistication of open firing and particularly the you know the open firings of prehistory so the answer is de a definite yes on that one thank you and a question for alessandro did you collaborate with experienced local boat builders in these projects how interested are the local boat builders in participating in experimental archaeology yes all, all the projects uh, relied on traditional Carpenters, boat builders, had shipwrights, and most of them are from uh, southern India because it's the region where uh, it's where they're still repairing and using uh, some uh, some plank vessel. While, for example, all these projects were carried out in Oman, in the Sultanate of Oman, in the Arabian Peninsula, and uh, there is no one now left. Although they were they used to build some boats in the past, up to the 70s, 80s, in the southern part of the country. There's no one who basically can uh, can build these boats anymore. All the work was done by skilled boat builders who um, mastered the the, the, the salt plank construction, and they were absolutely. I mean, it was actually absolutely wonderful to work with them, and they were great on sharing their their knowledge with us. Without this ethnographic analogies, this ethnographic input, we wouldn't be able to, I mean, to build these these boats. It, and they were uh, extremely, it was extremely interesting to see them working. And uh, because first of all, it, would, it adds the human aspect into these projects and uh, it tells us about uh, the people who build the boat because that's exactly the, you know, the, the main focus on uh, experimental archaeology, I, th I believe. And also it's a great um, thing to discuss with them, compare with them all the time, because obviously they, you ask them to build something that they don't build anymore. You ask, you ask them to build medieval boats, which are similar in terms of construction with uh, more uh, recent some boats in the in the region. But obviously, there, there are like some uh, significant difference. And so it's really, really interesting uh, during the construction to have this discussion with them, finding uh, a solution to problems. Uh, so absolutely, I think it's absolutely essential to work with people who actually know the, the subject. Wonderful. A question for Juicy. How apparent was the use of stones after 30 minutes of grinding? Are you planning to do longer experiments? 
Well, the experiment, uh, it's not just 30 minutes of branding. Every 30 minutes, I apply a documentation strategy that starts from micro scale, so documenting with 3D, and then apply microscopy technique. So the first thing is to understand how the use changed the geometry of the stone. Then microscopy to see how the use uh, changed the roughness of the stone and if use wear appear on the stone. And then I go to macro scale, uh, nano scale, sorry, to understand better this use wear. And in future, I'm planning to do also some measurements on this use wear in terms of length, depth. So I can, uh, I want to try to combine the material that's, that is grinded, the time, and the quantitative characteristics of this use wear. So uh, right now I'm doing a total of two hours of experimental phase and every 30 minutes I'm doing this documentation to see the evolution of the use wear in time. Fantastic, thank you. Shanti, thank you for joining us. I have a question about your outreach programs. Do you ever get inspired for new experiments or projects by the participants in your workshops? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. We are um, always delighted to uh, and get inspired by what uh, our participants are doing and um, also from their feedback and interactivity. It's a constant feedback and it's a constant uh, source of inspiration for all of us and the entire team. That's wonderful. Yeah, the program looks fantastic. And another question related to that. You mentioned that you're moving to online programs due to COVID. Um, As we all know, that brings many challenges as well as the opportunity to reach a much wider audience. What things have you found most successful in this new media? How much has the change in audience altered your approach or content? Uh, Well, it's completely changed uh, our program and our outreach um, efforts um, and experimental uh, methods have completely changed, uh, especially because you 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 are dealing with a completely different medium. So, for example, when we are working now with children who are online, uh, we have two main problems. And the first is that a large section of children whom we normally included, that is from underprivileged backgrounds, cannot participate so much because they have lack of access. So this is a a huge problem which we are facing. But uh, for the other children, which we we have two levels of interaction. One is for children and one is for the adults. But uh, for adults uh, in our program, there's not uh, a problem because this is mostly in the form of lectures and discussion meetings. But when we are dealing with uh, children, we have to provide them with a list of materials which they can have easily accessible in their houses. Uh, So this is an issue because uh, generally we provide all the material when they come to our center, but online we have to think of new materials which they can work with at home. So this should be something cheap and something which uh, everyone can access. So this is one thing which we have had to work around. And secondly, the timing for the experimental or the program um, or the programs. So this cannot be more than an hour uh, because of the internet connectivity issues or a little more than that, perhaps. And uh, to maintain interactivity online is something which is a challenge, but we have dealt with it. For example, uh, we recently we had an online program for children on, on the Neolithic and on early uh, agriculture. So when we are dealing with that, we have to think of strategies in which the children can actually, uh, you know, plant a seed and then we give them programs on how to develop and to track that over time or using uh, local material uh, for pottery, uh, for making tiny little pots at home. So using, say, a mixture of flour or plasticine or something like that. Uh, So these are issues that we have to innovate constantly and to experiment when devising our online strategies. So that's an issue. Yeah, I can absolutely imagine it must take a lot of creativity. Thank you. And then I have a question for Boris. For those of you, for those who are not familiar with metalworking, what would be the primary difference between Roman iron tools and modern steel tools? 
you can say sometimes there's no difference at all. Um, using planes, they are similar to, to those uh, you can buy in, in, in the shops. Some are very distinguished but, uh, and different, but the, the, the measures um, the Roman blacksmiths uh, are using um, are very sophisticated. Uh, let's say with a, with a um, hard iron uh, tip in, the, in a soft environment in um, which, which were uh, fire-forged together. All these different uh, techniques were already used by Romans, as you may know. Uh, planes are uh, similar to ours. Many, many tools are similar to ours. Uh, uh, scales, um, uh, even if uh, they are uh, different rulers, but but uh, are similar to ours. So if you are not using electricity, um, um, you can say roughly, roughly, the tools of the Romans are similar to ours. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. And then a question for Alessandro. Um, based on your perspective of medieval boat building, what sort of experiments might serve to push the field further? What experimental hypotheses are important to tackle in future projects? Ah, that's a really good question. I'll answer um, this question regarding the, the Indian Ocean. I mean, there's still a lot to do, basically, because the archaeological evidence is really, really limited. As I mentioned in the presentation, obviously, the tool maintenance and the use of actual or traditional tools is probably one of the main, uh, one of the most important aspects at the moment, because I, I was I was fascinated, basically, by it when uh, well, I was involved in this project. First is uh, obviously the making of these tools. Most of these carpenters and boat builder comes with their own tools and they and make their own tools, which is also something, an aspect which is very, very interesting uh, to, to calculate or to document in, a, in an experimental project. So I, I would say this uh, is probably one of the most uh, important aspects of this moment and until we find more archaeological evidence to you know, to expand our knowledge of this, of this uh, subject and of this topic. And obviously, well, obviously the other one is uh, testing these boats, building different, uh, different size boats, boats with different function and, and test them. That's also obviously another priority of these, uh, of these projects, uh, see the sailing performances and, and document every, every aspect and, and record them, the time required to uh, to build every element of the of the of the boats, also these provide insights into the labor and uh, work organization, and uh, all these aspects. That, and I mean, and, and brings to to the front the human again, you know, the, the people uh, behind these these boats. Fantastic! That's a really interesting point that they would have made their own tools. It's not something I would have considered. <laughs> and then a question for Uday. How was the iron ore crushed into powder before the smelting process? In my experiment, I crushed it with a hammer, with a uh, stones and hammer, hammer with the stones. Thank you. And then a question for George. You mentioned previous research, which you build upon. What parts of that documentation were missing in your eyes? And was there a possibility to use unpublished research data or speak with people involved in the research in previous decades? We try to follow a methodology where uh, the, um, the force comes from the archaeological evidence. And then we try to, to make protocol to link archaeological data, to link experimental protocol and archaeometry. I think one of the limits is the, is, is the question, right? the limit about that is clearly the knowledge, clearly the time, clearly the rentability, the production. And we see also that sometimes you, you made a protocol, you use the protocol many times, so like 10 or 15 times the same. And you can show that you can have different way to create something. So you need to record everything. You need a lot of time, so like the other ones say. And you are not sure at the end which way they use because the validation from experimentation comes only from the archaeological data. So of course you can you can compare you can validate uh, artifact with experimental artifacts and you can validate also by the um, archaeometry. It's really interesting because all disciplines can talk together and bring new idea of uh, makes that makes sense. But of course, the the, the best thing if, is to come back in the past. The best thing is to to be a little most with a with a huge camera and to see many things that is impossible. Sometimes you can touch the, the knowledge uh, on my side. Sometimes you see some 
details from the reality i can say that from the for the hands from the in the past but of course the limit is this is we are just learning we don't know we are just always i'm learning in the future and that takes so many times to understand what they do really they are so brilliant they are so smart that's really complicated because so like so like you we are just students and when you are with new uh, uh, evidence all of the time is new question and sometimes you have a little knowledge from from melting and then you have a new site and you see new things and everything is different so i think that's the limit clearly is the the human that's the, really the, the limits so you we must be very careful and just propose a way, just chain of patois. Chain of patois is just a methodology, it's just something to understand what you would like to say at the end. And so for this moment, for us, the only good validation comes from the archaeological data and to say, okay, I produce something linked with the archaeological data, absolutely not the same. And clearly, I don't know if you ask me, we spent thousands and thousands of hours to make the smelting in Ensona. Um, and we are not sure at the end. We just have maybe more highly about the chain opératoire and for rentability, for hours, for um, for the production. And so this is just something impossible to answer. So Thank you. A question for Simriti. What was the most difficult part of your research? What would you have done differently or are planning to do differently in future experiments? Um, I mean, I have to say, <laughs> The most difficult part was uh, trying to figure out how to do the open firing. Um, so we've done two so far. The first one was just terrible. I think all our parts broke. Um, but then we, I think we learned quite a bit from that one. I have to say we've been using YouTube videos as our main source of information so far. But recently, Uday and I have actually visited uh, many potters in Tamil Nadu. So we've been also learning from watching uh, how they do some of it. Um, but what we want to do now is uh, have a much more direct interaction with them and learn uh, from them and see how we can actually get better at it. Uh, so as as well as doing the firing, we've also been learning to do pottery. Um, and again, that's been like a mixed bag. I don't think we've been very successful. Our pots are still quite terrible. Um, so I think we, hopefully that's something we can work on but it also requires a lot of time so we've been trying to balance like work and trying to get this done i think one of the other hard parts of the whole thing has been the perception that while we feel we're working really hard people perceive it as us just kind of like having fun so i think it's also really hard to project the seriousness of the work that we're doing thank you and a question for shanti how many children who participate in your workshops go on to continue archaeology? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know, actually. I have not kept track. There have been so many from 1999 onwards. There have been so many. So for the school children, I don't know. But for the college students, that is at the from the undergraduate level onwards, yes, we do know of uh, several of them who have later gone on to do their postgraduate degree in archaeology. So that was great to hear. So I think they they got the whole fun and the spirit of the subject. So, but for school children, I honestly haven't kept track. I will do now. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. And then a problem for uh, Juicy. Could you explain a bit more about the general question behind the experiments? The main idea was to create a collection to compare with the tools from Brinzani. The idea is to create this collection both for stone and also for residues. So the stone are documented with a multi-technique pipeline to reproduce the geometry of the stone, the uh, roughness of the stone, and going to the nanoscale to characterize the use wear. And also we are thinking, we are starting some pivotal with micro CT to understand the entrapment of the use-related residues in the crevices of the stone. Their project is running in parallel uh, the trace analysis and the residues analysis. 
and I'm doing this reproduction of the trace on the stone to compare with the archaeological one. And at the same time, we are creating also a database of possible resource using during uh, early Upper Paleolithic to compare the residues found on the archaeological stone with some experimental one. Thank you. I have another question for Alessandro. How different was the historical building procedure from the techniques modern certain plank crafts people are familiar with? Well, that's a good question because uh, we don't really know much about the historical I mean, historical uh, boat building practice. I mean, historical sources are very vague and lack of details and archaeological evidence are extremely limited. And so we rely on uh, the ethnographic records of the region. And I believe that the, the construction method doesn't really change much, which means there's a strong link between the present and the past, and uh, especially regarding boat buildings in, the, in this region. Also because uh, we have, a re I mean, the, the similarity between them and uh, and uh, more recent ethnographic records are striking. So I believe that not much has changed, but with this, I don't mean, uh, obviously, and it's not like a judgment on the past, uh, or actually on modern, more recent world building traditions. It just reveals a strong link between uh, the two, between the different periods, and also indicates the success of these sound boats, the adaptability of these sound boats, and the persistence of this construction technique until recently. Thank you. And then a final question for Simriti and Shanti. How did you find attitudes to your work from the craft experts such as potters? I think it, it's much harder to explain exactly why we're interested or what we plan to do, but mostly we found them extremely kind of warm and very generous, uh, which just made me feel worse because I felt like we were just going there to like ask a lot of questions and waste their time, but they were being so nice to us. But I think that's one of the reasons we want to like see how we can actually create a much more equitable relationship going forward. Fantastic. Thank you. When we worked with potters, uh, we first uh, had, a fee had a session with them earlier to explain what we why you see at archaeological sites, for example, uh, yeah, reports and things like that. After they did that, we gave them an idea as to why we were doing the workshop for children and for various different age groups. And then we had the workshop subsequently. Uh, so that was with the traditional potter. But with the professional potter, who is an expert, an educated uh, expert in pottery, highly educated with a PhD, one of our colleagues, uh, th this lady also explained to the children very carefully why, what she was doing, why she was doing a little bit of the archaeological background, and then we had the workshop. So we worked with two different uh, types of experts in pottery coming from different backgrounds, one traditional and one totally modern and uh, highly educated. So that made a huge difference in the entire um, organization of the workshop and in mutual uh, understanding between all of us. Thank you. That's really interesting. So I'll wrap up the question and answer session there. Thank you so much for joining.